Monetary policy is one of those things that dis disappeared from the uh, political agenda over the last 15 years. But over the last three or four years, of course, it's been very high on the agenda. So how has our attitude to monetary policy and what it changed and what have we learned? Well, one of the big things that's changed, I mean, right across the richer countries in the world, right across Europe, UK, US, is that something happened that we thought was very unlikely to happen, which is that interest rates got down to such a low level they couldn't really be cut any further. So in the US, the Fed, the European Central Bank, the Bank of England, other central banks have found that they've pushed interest rates down virtually to their floor, essentially to zero. Uh, and that is a flaw because it's, it's one of the things that it's virtually impossible for central banks to do is to push interest rates to negative levels. Uh, and that's, that's a problem because you may get into a situation, I think we have been in this situation in many countries in recent years, where if you could have negative interest rates, that's probably what you needed because the economies were in such a recession that you probably wanted monetary policy to be super expansionary. Uh, but that's a difficult place to get to. And I think the reason is in some ways quite straightforward. Central banks can make interest rates 4%, 5%, 3%, 15%, 1%. To make them minus 1% is very difficult. And the reason is that once you get to negative interest rates, people no longer have any incentive to put money in a bank. If a bank is paying you a negative interest rate, you're going to get less back from the bank in six months, 12 months, than when you put the money in. Well, you've always got an alternative that beats that, which is simply to keep the money in notes and coins. Just put it under the bed, bury it in a tin in the garden. And I think that's what people would do if interest rates in the banking system were significantly negative. And that's why central banks really run up against a limit to what they can do in terms of interest rates anyway, once they get down to very close to zero. And that, that's where we've been in, in many economies uh, in, in recent times. Nobody really thought that's where we'd get to. What about we've heard about quantitative easing? What does that mean and how does that relate to the, the problems David's outlined? Well, in a sense, I mean, w when you get to that uh, zero lower bound of interest rates or very close to it, you end up in a funny situation, which is you can actually flood uh, the economy or have, you know, in a sense, almost as much money in the economy as you, you want to print as a central bank, and it won't send interest rates any lower for the reasons David said. So, so you're in a situation really where you can either choose to supply enough money to keep interest rates just at zero and no more, or you can supply a lot more than is required, and it's to interest rates stay at zero, but obviously there's more money in the system. And I think there was, you know, I don't know where the view even really begin, you know, this idea that, that just the act of printing that money would suddenly create hyperinflation out of nowhere. And clearly that wasn't what was expected to happen, and that isn't what has happened. In a sense, when, you, when we're in this situation, when we're in an economic uh, downturn, uh, actually a lot of people, a lot of banks are very happy to hold cash just as a, as a savings instrument. They're not going to say, you know, here's some more money, I want to go and spend it. Those are not the conditions we're in. They're very happy to hold that cash as savings. And so what we've seen is uh, central banks supplying more uh, money into the economy and that, that money in a sense being hoarded by various institutions. And so what quantitative easing is trying to do is saying, well, we're going to push that money out, but at the same time we're going to buy something with it, normally government bonds, but it could also be uh, private sector debt, and try and basically reduce the interest rates on those longer term interest rates. We've already put the short term interest rate to zero. Let's try and push down longer rates uh, for long, uh, longer term borrowers by basically uh, buying up those longer term assets. And uh, that's, uh, in a sense, an experiment that many countries are trying at the moment. And Certainly in the first stage, the evidence suggests with some success that we ha there seems to be evidence that actually longer term borrowing rates have fallen as a result of this policy. The question of you know, whether that's, how much good that's done to, to the economies who've, who've actually implemented it is, is still a very open question in, in economics, a very current question in economics. But certainly the first step, we've got good evidence that, uh, you know, that we've got short in term interest rates for sort of three month borrowing and less down and now we're also achieving even uh, lower interest rates for longer term borrowers. I think there's, Francis makes a, a very interesting and, and good point there, and it's something we try and explain as clearly as we can in, in the book, and I think there's a lot of misunderstanding about this point. And it's this, that central banks find it relatively straightforward and easy to move a particular interest rate. 
which is a short-term interest rate. It's, it's a rate that the ECB sets, the Fed, the Bank of England. It's the announcement you get. It's on the news in the evening. It's the interest rate they can control. But of course, the interest rates that really matter in an economy are not, are not directly the ones that the central bank can move around. They're the interest rates on mortgages if you're borrowing to finance house purchase. They're the interest rates you have to pay as a company borrowing from a bank, not borrowing from the central bank, but borrowing from a commercial bank. They're the interest rates that companies have to pay if they're issuing bonds in the bond market. Now, in normal times, the central bank can move its interest rate, and those other interest rates will tend to move with it. And that really is what gives the central bank a lever on the economy. But in stressed conditions, and when the central bank has pushed the interest rate down to zero, they've kind of lost the ability to move those other interest rates. And those, in, those other interest rates tend to remain at very substantially positive levels, even though the rate the, bank, the central bank can control may be down at zero. And quantitative easing is really a way of trying to get at those other rates through the central bank using its ability to buy things by creating new money. And the things that they've been buying are, on the whole, longer dated bonds. Sometimes they're issued by government, sometimes, as Francis said, they're issued by companies themselves, private sector bonds, in an attempt to, in a sense, make those assets more scarce, drive their prices up, and drive the interest rates on those things down. And this has happened on a scale that is truly extraordinary. And the, I mean, the, the balance sheet of the US Fed has tripled in the period between when it started quantitative easing uh, and, uh, and more recently. The same thing is true of, of the Bank of England. The ECB is operated in a slightly different way, but its balance sheet during the financial crisis also increased absolutely enormously. And this is a, this, understanding how, this, how these transactions are, operate and whether or not they've done any good, I think is, is a really crucial issue and not very well understood, to be honest. So we take some pains in the book to try to, first of all, explain exactly what's going on here, because it can be very confusing. People sometimes think, well, what does it mean the central bank creates money? Do they literally you know, pour money out the front door of the central bank? Well, no, not really. And, and actually, it's transactions where the central bank is buying something. Uh, so we try and explain the mechanics of the operations and then look at some of the evidence, as Francis was saying, about wh whether it's actually done any good. So this is really kind of economics laboratory, is what we're seeing around, around the world and what we have seen over the last few years. I mean, in, in many ways, yes. I mean, uh, we have a lot more historical evidence about what happens when you change interest rates, clearly, because that's no the normal way monetary policy operates. Quantitative easing is a policy that is you know, we very rarely operated. Not, it was not sort of, you know, completely uh, out of uh, any history, but it's, you know, it is, a, it is a rare event. And therefore, like anything, you know, you, taking theories of how it should work and testing them with data is difficult when you've only got a relatively short period. I mean, that's a problem that we have often in economics of actually how to test our theories in the sort of laboratory of the real world. Isn't one of the main messages from the, from the crisis that economics isn't always isn't black and white. In fact, you're negotiating grey areas continually, and that's the nature of the, the science. Well, I think that this is a grey area for the reason that Francis said. You know, that we've had a lot of experience over many decades of what tends to happen when central banks move interest rates. We've got virtually no evidence from recent economic history of what happens when a central bank, on a truly massive scale, buys assets by creating new money and massively increases the size of its balance sheet. I mean, they're just, you can't look at historical evidence and say, well, what happened the last time we did this? There wasn't a last time we did this. Uh, and so, you know, in that sense, it is a gray area or something of a step into the uh, unknown. Uh, one of the things that we try and do in the book is uncover at least some of the, the, the mystique in some ways that lies behind this operation and show exactly what transactions take place and give, give people a kind of framework for thinking about what, what the economic impact might be as the money flows through the system. 